Welcome to Strike Fighters 2 Vietnam. We will be following the career of a young Navy pilot as he tries to survive the air war over Vietnam starting in 1965. As a young bright-eyed ensign, eager for action, and then uh, we'll follow him as he transitions into a, a, a weathered veteran pilot just trying to make it home. <laughs> Hopefully not get shot down. So let's start by creating said pilot. Uh, let's see, I wish to create a new pilot. Corner. Devin. Call sign. Hornet. Except. So, Horner. Devin. Call sign Hornet. Second, well, the rank will be Ensign. If I was in the Air Force, it would be Second Lieutenant, so that's why it's showing up here. But, uh, zero flight hours, no campaigns, no kills whatsoever. Uh, we have all of our stock photos of pilots here. Most of Vietnam era, although there are a couple that are um, World War II vintage as well, like that one for example. But, I got this guy, and uh, there's 22 year old Devin Horner on board the USS Enterprise in 2004. So, we're going to use that. There's our fella. So, we're going to begin in 1965 with Operation Steel Tiger, which is an interdiction mission. Uh, we do not want to be the Air Force. We want to be Uncle Sam's Yacht Club. And I'm going to be a A1H Sky Raider, WBA-52. We'll do normal difficulty and supply. Uh, let's see, we'll make this Devin's let's fly one space one, that way I can find it later alright Operation Steel Tiger on April 3rd 1965 elements of the US 2nd Air Division initiate Operation Steel Tiger a covert aerial interdiction effort against foot and truck traffic in southeastern Laos Eventually assumed by 7th Air Force and U.S. Navy Task Force 77, this operation targets the infiltration of men and materiel moving south of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, or North Vietnam, through southeastern Laos to support the communist insurgency in the Republic of Vietnam, a.k.a. South Vietnam, during the conflict. The purpose of Steel Tiger is to stem the flow of supplies on enemy logistical routes collectively known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the Trong Sung Strategic Supply Route to the North Vietnamese, VA-52 Knight Riders equipped with the A-1H Sky Raider and flying from Yankee Station in the Gulf of Tonkin is assigned to take part in this operation. And here we are in our hangar, in a little picture of the A-1, obviously ours does not look like that, that's the Air Force SEA camo. We have the USN Gray. Call sign is Crab. Ooh, we have four Sky Raiders. Provide close air support to friendly units defending Kang Tree. Prevent enemy units from advancing into the area. So right off the bat, we have a classic A1 ground attack uh, close air support mission. So that's, that's interesting, right out of the gate. Uh, here's us. Home base is CV-14 Ticonderoga, which is a Essex, World War II Essex-class carrier, which has been refitted. I'll talk about that a little bit once we're in the air and we have some time. Uh, our, we have a strength of 16, so we have a full squadron, 100% supply. Um, VA-25, that's, that's an A-1J squadron off the Midway. They're nearby. Looks like they're not participating today or these Crusaders, or these Skyhawks. So I guess it's going to be just us up in the sky. Maybe some of these... Oh, here we go. Uh, this RF-4 squadron out of Da Nang. So they're going to be taking pictures of something. Alright. 
So it looks like we're going to be mostly alone today. That's okay. Oh, before I go, you can see the the shortness of the uh, of the flight plan. Here's our initial point. We're going to be at 6,000 feet at 200 knots, and we will we will be there in 13 minutes. So from takeoff to initial point, it's only 13 minutes, um, which means that the default loadout that which includes a drop tank is completely not necessary. 300 gallon drop tank, that's like hours worth of fuel, especially for an A1. So, uh, let's see here. The takeoff is 744. Let's make a note of that. Because we want to be over the target at 759. Um, although this is not a joint strike, so I think the timing is less important. We just need to get there and loiter um, to help out the troops. In fact, is there a loiter time listed on... Um, no. It doesn't actually list a loiter time, but if we get there fast, then we can be on hand immediately in case any troops come up. Uh, so let's see. So let's go to the load out here. So as an ensign, you'll notice all these are grayed out. I can't make any changes to either my paint scheme or markings. Um, that changes as you increase in rank, so later on, as we have more responsibility within the squadron, we'll be able to change some of this if we want. So let's see what we have here. So first of all, 300 gallon drop tank. 300 gallons uh, times six. Six gallons, or I'm sorry, six pounds per gallon is gonna be 1800 pounds of fuel, uh, which may be that may be more fuel than we're going to expend during this entire flight. So that is not necessary. But what is necessary is a good old CBU 24 cluster bomb. So I'm going to put three of those on. Don't want any rocket pops right now. I think we're just going to go. How much? How much nape can I put on here? I guess I could put a rocket launcher. Yeah, well, 32 rocket pod. We'll do those just in case. Oh, all right. I'm gonna change all of these as well. The cluster boom. Cluster boom. If I give the AI rocket pods, they will always use the rocket pods first, instead of bombs. So, for Crab 2, I'm just going to leave this empty and he's just going to have uh, bombs on. But I think Crab 3, we'll go, oh, we'll give him a fire bomb first of all, and then I think we're just going to go all rockets with him, because why not, 32 rockets. 32A rockets, and, uh, yeah. do these little guys. That's an anti-personnel, like, fragmentation bomb, so we'll give him that. And then this fella, oops, that. How about cluster bomb, cluster bomb, give him a rocket pod, and then a bunch of napalm. I'll actually make it the same as, as my loadout. Oh. Napalm. And napalm. All right. Loadout usually will not take this long, 
Normally with the A1 missions, you only have two aircraft going up, so it's much easier. Alright, and uh, here's our roster for today. We see Ensign Horner, his Crab 1, 0 kills, 0 missions. Uh, here we go, this looks like the XO of the squadron is going to be my is going to be my three man. He'll be in charge of the second element. Um, he's got 11 missions. Lieutenant Egan. JG Springfield will be on his wing and my wingman is Ensign Stender. Alright. Well, we're going to head up the deck and uh, get ready to go. Launching. Gears up. Flaps are up. There's a picket ship. So the carrier launches, you have to get off very quickly because if you let the AI launch off of Catapult 2 before you do, they can be real dumb sometimes and trying to circle around to get back to you, they will crash into the ocean. So, uh, yeah. So when launching off of a carrier, you've got to get off the deck fast. So that was, that was the reason for the hasty launch. No preamble. And, uh, Ships three and four are, are launching right now. They'll catch up, so we'll just head to head to our waypoint. So I'm using Track IR for the camera movements, which is a brand new toy uh, that I just bought. It's been out for many years now, but I never really knew about it. I would see videos with people using, you know, using the uh, the setup, but I didn't know what it was called or where to, you know, anything about it. So I finally really got some, some details on it, and a week or two ago I bought it, and I've really been enjoying it since. So, so this is a uh, Track IR. It's an infrared camera that's mounted on my headset, which tracks my head movements and uh, translates that into camera movements inside the aircraft. So real quick, as I zoom in here, you can see that we took off with essentially 2,300 pounds of fuel. Now this plane will burn so little fuel, again, justifying why I don't need that 300 gallon drop tank, uh, we're only going to burn about 300 pounds of fuel, which is about 50 gallons uh, by the time we're over the target. So when we're, when we're egressing the target area, we will be at 19 or 20 for weight. Remember, that is pounds of fuel, not gallons. That's six pounds per gallon fuel weight for ad gas. So, uh, yeah, just not necessary. Oh, we can climb at about 150 knots, too. I'm not climbing at my most efficient speed. VY <laughs> for aviation people. Uh, best rate of climb. Set my bomb quantities here. Uh, actually, let's do two. And you can see the release per second knob is going up. I think uh, I think seven is a good setting. Have a actually no, let's do six. Wrong button. Six with a quantity of two. That should be just enough space between the bombs that. Uh, I'll be able to hit any target I'm aiming at, hopefully. 
Usually I'm pretty good. Sometimes I miss, though. We'll see. And we are at our assigned altitude. Got to give it some right rudder because the uh, obviously being a prop engine, we have a lot of uh, left turning tendencies because of torque. And as our speed comes up, I'm actually going to reduce throttle to cruise. So I'll go right to 40 inches manifold pressure. The engine in these Sky Raiders is the R3350, um, which has several variants, but the base engine was used on everything from B-29s, uh, C-97 Strata Freighter, before they upgraded it to the to the bigger engines, the, what the hell are they, 40, 4350s, um, DC-7s, C-119s, uh, Constellations and Super Constellations, and P-2 Neptunes, uh, stuff like that. The engine had a power range from between 2200 RPM, uh, RPM, 2200 horsepower to 3500 horsepower, depending on the application and uh, which variant. Our horsepower output for these Sky Raiders is about 27 or 2800 horsepower. Let's see, let's... So here's the USS Ticonderoga, which I said at one point uh, earlier was an Essex class. You can see the, the aircraft elevator in between the two catapults. Uh, that's reminiscent of the old... Um, of the old World War II style. That remained there. You can see the other elevator is right at the end of the landing area, which... Uh, Obviously, that was moved um, from the original Essex class, and uh, that being there was kind of an annoyance because it was in the way of both uh, any waste catapult shots and also, obviously, it's in the middle of the landing zone. So it was essentially useless during recovery or even some launch operations. This was addressed in the, uh, in the next class of ship, which was the Midway class of carriers. They moved that elevator to the port side aft, uh, so it's just to the left of the arresting cables that you would see here. Um, and there, there was more space to park. You can see on the left side of the ship, there is, or on the left side of the landing zone, there is zero extra space. Like, it's just, they, they plunked this angled deck down in, uh, 1956. You know, originally all the Essex classes were straight decked. Uh, just all, uh, all one big deck. But then in the, uh, Oh, crap. 40s or 50s, the Royal Navy actually invented the angle deck because they realized if you put the angle deck on, then you could perform both launch and recovery operations at the same time. So, uh, that was a random segue, but you can, you can see the size of this ship is pretty small. Not a lot of room on the deck. For reference, the Ticonderoga flight deck is 888 feet long. Compare that to the next class, the Midway class was 968, so almost 100 feet longer. The class after that was Forrestal, that was the first of the quote-unquote super carriers that were designed from the ground up with the angled deck and uh, enough space for the larger aircraft of the Vietnam era. She was about, well, she was 1,070 feet long. And then after that, the Enterprise ended up being 1,123 feet long. So you can see that it's like almost 300 feet shorter than the supercarrier length. And there it is. There's Vietnam. This is our, our first time being over the country. Obviously, other people in the squadron have done combat missions here, but this is still really early on. This is still 1965. So not many sorties have been have been launched just yet. The Ticonderoga was actually the very first ship to uh, to see action in Vietnam. They were 
involved with the Gulf of Tonkin incident when the USS Maddox, a U.S. destroyer, was attacked by several torpedo boats from North Vietnam. They radioed for assistance, and the Ticonderoga dispatched four F-8 Crusaders armed with rockets to the area. And the Crusaders came in, and they used rockets and machine guns and damaged and sunk, uh, sank all of the torpedo boats. Two days later, uh, which would have been April, I'm sorry, August 4th, uh, the Ticonderoga sent out more Crusaders for yet another motorboat incident with a different destroyer who had teamed up with the Maddox. So, so they were there, the Ticonderoga was there during the start of all this. So we're nine miles away from our initial point. I'm just going to go ahead and select my cluster bombs right now. There's nothing more embarrassing or shitty than diving on a target, pressing the release button, and not having selected any bombs. So nothing drops off the airplane. That just sucks. One, you look like an idiot. But two, more importantly, you then have to swing around again and make another pass which means you're more susceptible to being shot down from anti-aircraft. So it really, really is a dangerous thing to, uh, to not do that, to not prep for that. So I like to do it ahead of time, either right after takeoff or uh, at least at the initial point, I select the first weapon I'm going to use to make sure that something drops off the airplane when I say so. Okay, there's our initial point. Geez, looks like they're in the city. Looks like maybe the North Vietnamese are attempting to invade the city. U.S. forces are stationed within the city and are holding them off. That could make things difficult. Oh, there it is. See the red smoke? Red smoke is... Uh, is indicating friendly squadrons, whereas green smoke is indicating enemy squadrons. And we're going to go ahead and cheat here and turn this HUD back on. There we go. There's the target. We're going to tell Flight 1, engage ground. Two, copy that. Okay, here we go. So if they're all in line along the north side of the city, I'm going to come in and uh, turn 90 degrees to my left here. Maybe drop some bombs. Oh, there goes some rockets. Bomb the 
my frame rates from that napalm. So as I passed over, I could see that there was a whole line of several VC squads right there near this one that's targeted, so I've selected Napalm. We're going to swing around and uh, drop a couple of Napalms on them and hopefully take out a couple of squadrons. I'm going to increase... shit. I'm going to increase my interval time. Screw it, we'll put it at 9. See here's oh you can see there's a whole there's a whole bunch the one two three four looks like five different VC squads all next to each other. Hopefully I can take out a whole gaggle of them with this napalm. What's two got? Oh, he's got, uh... One, three, One, four, we can see three or four, three and four ahead of two. Let's see if they've dropped any ordnance. Doesn't look like it. Maybe they were just firing guns or rockets. Here comes two. He dropped all three of his cluster bombs. Target hit. I didn't even see him go off. Point seven. Austin, one. Red Crown. Copy that. One. Three in the car. 
One, two. We have four napalm left. And then a rocket pod. Shit, well. Bombs away. That's going to be my next target. If I can get the two of them lined up, then maybe I can take two out with the last two remaining napalms. Oh. I was mistaken. I have rocket pods left. Swing it back around. Get these guys with rockets. Somebody with rockets coming in behind me. I don't know who dropped the bomb. I don't see any bomb explosions just yet. Oh, there they are. Oh, look at that. Somebody still had napalm on board. Napalm really kills my frame rate. Now I know we got the clearance to return to base because the mission was complete, but I'm staying here until all of our ammo is expelled. I want to make sure that uh, our guys on the ground aren't getting abandoned and can repel this attack. So we're sticking it out until, until the job's done. Let's use some guns on these guys. Yes. There's two more squadrons down there. I see you. <sighs> so let's spin around this way. Please. 
Shit. Well, we got that other squadron with the guns. Friendly troops are within this city defending somewhere. So the smoke doesn't uh, is not indicating exact troop positions. The smoke is actually fired from grenade launchers from the different uh, infantry squads. So the so the VC squads are actually launching red smoke when they're firing at our allied troops. And so if they don't if they're not hitting exactly, they're just landing approximately uh, in the direction of the friendly troops, and vice versa with the green smoke when our guys are shooting at the, uh, the Vietnamese. Oop, that's it. That's the end of my rockets. But we got plenty of gun. Explosive weapons. Oh. Room. Uh, but we're decimating these guys even with our cannons. Four twenty millimeter cannons. That's a, a lot of uh, explosive power alone. That might have been our last target. I'm not picking up anything else. And it looks like 4 was going for the same target as I was. Ooh, there's my shadow. I think that's it. I think we've killed everybody. Let's go back to 40 inches on the on the engine and call everyone back into formation. Rejoin, please. Copy. I'm rejoining. Let's see here. Oh. So there's some US troops. They're like inside the buildings. Oh no, here's a couple. You can see the smoke from the napalm off in the distance there. And here. Oh, there we go. There's two of our guys flying by. Alright, well done everybody. Let's head for the extraction point. We'll egress the area, which I'm going to climb back up to 6,000 feet as well. And if you look at our fuel, we're at uh, 1,800 pounds, so uh, still the same neighborhood, slightly less than what I uh, predicted, but that's because we stayed in the area a lot longer circling to uh, destroy targets, but we still only burned 100 extra pounds from what I estimated. We're still in the neighborhood. We're still more than 75% full of fuel. So, clearly adding an extra actual munition to the underside of the airplane is a better better deal than just having a 300 gallon tank which is going to be useless 
um, not useless, not necessary. Well, it is useless if the AI jettison it, which they do as soon as you order them to attack, they'll dump all of their drop tanks. So basically, you'd be wasting 250 gallons of fuel uh, times three because they would all just jettison that tank. So I'd rather just give them bombs and actually uh, accomplish the job at hand. Two miles out from our from our waypoint. Oh, and there's six thousand feet. As we hit the waypoint. And throttle back to 40 inches for cruise. There's Ticonderoga. Do we have another ship? Nope. We are the only carrier right now. I mean, the midway is somewhere on station, but it looks like they didn't draw it uh, for this mission. Okay, time to compress a little bit. Those guys didn't have any ordnance left on them, but it looks like they jettisoned all of their uh, bomb racks and various things on the underside of, of the aircraft. And they're all going to uh, get set up for landing here. We're coming up close to the ship. I'm going to descend down to 2,000 feet. See the ship yet?
Oop, there's some picket ships off in the distance that we're going to be passing over. There's some more. Turn our lights on. Craft and there's our ship, and that is our permission to land. There we go. Target that that ship. Dropping the tail hook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to overfly the ship at 2,000 feet. Once I'm over it, I will deploy speed brakes and perform a left brake. Uh, perform my overhead 360. Well, it's actually going to be a 180, I guess. But the military style approach, you keep high speed up over the landing area and then you brake to... Uh, Form a 180, getting you on the downwind leg for landing and slowing you down so you can drop both wheels and flaps. So that's what we're going to, need to do, and then we'll be uh, we'll be right nearby to perform a landing. And we're over the ship. And we're just going to break. We're also going to drop down to uh, eh, maybe 1500. Oops. Flaps are down. And we'll be on turn. Now, because of the poor visibility at the front of this cockpit, um, I'm going to I make steeper approaches to the carrier than I normally would on a land base. But I also have to make sure I try to keep the speed down so I don't bounce over the arresting cables. There, if we look up a little bit, I can see a little bit further over the nose. Yeah, we're coming down. There's our wires. And we'll pitch up and capture. Flaps up. Hook is up. Lights are off. Taxi clear of the landing area. So we'll just do the brakes and then we will exit from here.
So here we are at the debriefing. A1 Sky Raider close air support. Uh, we provided our close air support to our units. The attack was repulsed and uh, it was an outstanding success. Lots of targets destroyed. You can see over here lots of uh, all of our hit percentages and a bunch of kills and uh, several logs. So there we are. That's the uh, first mission is resounding success. We'll have to see what the next mission brings.